Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone, uh, wherever you are in the world today. Um, good to see so many people uh, uh, joining us or, or, or trickling in as, uh, as we are. Maybe we'll just uh, uh, wait a few uh, seconds just for people to finish joining us. Okay, right. So um, welcome everyone. This is the uh, the fifth uh, of, of our Toolbox Presents webinars. Um, I'd just like to thank the supporters of um, the Toolbox application um, who are listed here for, for making these webinars possible. And uh, just a note as well that we um, it is possible to sponsor these webinars and these webinars will happen uh, every month uh, for the rest of the year. And if you uh, look on this slide, we'll be talking about a whole range of topics over the next uh, sort of six, seven months uh, on uh, to, all to do with learning from incidents and, and related topics. Uh, today's topic is obviously uh, May, May the 19th, uh, learning from what goes right. Our 21st of June webinar is going to focus on lifting operations. Uh, what can we learn from past learning incidents? Um, and, uh, and, and if you're interested in that webinar, you can register uh, for that webinar now from the Energy Institute website or from the Toolbox website directly. Um, and the same goes for the rest of the webinars in our uh, webinar series. So uh, just uh, to firstly quickly introduce myself. So I'm Stuart King, Good Practice Manager for Human Performance and Power Systems at the Energy Institute. And I project manage the Toolbox uh, website uh, and the webinars that we're putting on this year are uh, essentially to help promote the usage of Toolbox. Uh, Toolbox is a completely free to use web application and it hosts uh, uh, lessons learned from incidents from uh, serious hazards or serious incidents I should say. Um, the Toolbox app is all about saving lives and sharing life-saving learning we have something like, uh, well, over 500 learning resources on, on the app now, including around 80 or 90 videos. Uh, the, uh, most of that content has been translated into uh, 10 different languages. And as I said, it's completely free to use. You don't need to log in. You don't need to uh, register. You could just go onto the, anyone can go onto the app. I'm thinking supervisors and frontline workers, HSC managers, go onto the app and fairly quickly find uh, lessons learned from incidents that are related to uh, the job that they're doing that day. So please do uh, visit the, the app and see if it's something that you want to use if you haven't done so already. The web address is toolbox.energyinst.org. And following this email, uh, sorry, following this uh, webinar, we will be sending an email around uh, with the recording of the webinar, as well as links to some of the things that we're talking about today. Just a bit of uh, webinar housekeeping. So the webinar is being recorded and uh, that recording will be made available in the next few days. Um, and that, that will be on YouTube and available also on the Toolbox website itself. Um, all participants are muted except for the presenters. If you have questions, and I do strongly advise you to uh, uh, post questions because we will have a, a Q&A session after our two presentations, uh, please post those in the Q&A button, uh, which you're using the Q&A button, uh, which should be perhaps at the bottom of your screen or perhaps at the top of your screen, depending on which version of Zoom you're using. Uh, please do not post questions into the chat because we will not be chat we will not be looking at the chat. Uh, please post your questions in the Q and A uh, section. And uh, lastly, uh, after the the webinar, um, I believe there will be a survey or a short survey. Um, please do uh, take a couple of minutes to fill that survey out and let us know how we're doing. Um, and we we could use that to feedback to uh, improve what we do next time. Uh, just a quick note, if you're a member of the Energy Institute, don't forget to um, uh, record or don't forget that the, the webinar can count towards your uh, CPD, your continuous professional development. Um, if you're not a member of the Energy Institute, 
you might want to consider becoming one. Um, but if you're a member of another uh, another organisation, um, it's possible that you can also use the webinar um, for um, c to get CPD points or, or uh, you know, however your your member your chosen uh, member membership organisation uh, you know does that. So don't forget that. Uh, just very briefly, and you know, who 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 are the Enid Institute? You're you're sitting there thinking. So, um, we are a technical institute with a professional body for the global energy industry. We essentially are here to deliver good practice, uh, knowledge, um, and improve professionalism um, across the, the energy sector. That's not just oil and gas. That includes power, onshore wind, offshore wind, solar, energy storage hydrogen, carbon capture and storage. Uh, we've got something like 20,000 individual members and uh, around 300 company members, I believe. One of the key things that the Energy Institute does is, as I said, we produce good practice guidance as well as standards on a whole range of issues that affect the energy sector, uh, including asset integrity, aviation refueling, uh, as I said, carbon capture and storage, environmental management, uh, human factors, that's my um, that's my area, as well as power systems, hydrogen, you know, a whole raft of um, safety, environmental, health, and, and other um, issues. Uh, so please do check out our website, publishing.energyinst.org, uh, where you can get access to our guidance and a lot of that guidance is made freely available as well. So an example of something that we've produced uh, this year or over the really over the last uh, sort of last year but published uh, earlier this year and you may have seen that because it relates to the topic of today's webinar and that's a video called Learning Before Incidents. This completely free uh, video you can find it. I won't include the link here, because just because you, it's a YouTube link. It would be, you know, you won't be able to uh, copy that down. But um, my suggestion is go to YouTube or go to the Toolbox app and just search "Learning Before Incidents," and you you should see um, this video pop up, um, uh, particularly on YouTube as well, um, with, with the little tray, and you'll you'll recognise it instantly. Um, now that, that video was produced based on. Uh, some of the work that we'll be talking uh, uh, hearing from uh, on today's webinar. Right, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the speakers for today's webinar. So our first week, uh, speaker is Professor Jop Bronerweg. So uh, Jop graduated uh, in uh, cognitive psychology in 1985 at Leiden University on the concept of impossible accidents at sea. His PhD research was aimed at identifying the systemic factors that contribute uh, to incidents. And since 2017, he is the director of the Centre for Safety in Healthcare at the TUD. Um, he's also a human factor specialist at Leiden University and TNO, um, and a board member of the Tripod Foundation. Uh, Martin, uh, or Dr. Martin Nazaruk. Uh, works for Baker Hughes. He's technically trained in different types of psychology, uh, cognitive, social, behavioural, clinical, neuro, occupational and industrial. Um, uh, business change and management, uh, safety, uh, systems thinking, executive coaching, uh, instructional design and more. Marcin is the co-chair of the Step Change in Safety's Human Factors Working Group. Um, uh, Human Factors Technical Section Chairperson for the SBE, uh, Co-Founder and uh, Steering Committee Member of uh, HBOG or HBOG, uh, and is also a technical author for IOGP. So, um, without, let me, let me just move on. So, uh, Yop, I believe you're going to be sharing your presentation. So, let me just, let's just hand over. Okay, thank you. Can you see the... We can. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Stuart, for your extremely kind introduction. Um, and indeed, I will talk a bit about learning from what goes right. Um, and the idea behind it is that we underutilize the information that is available in organizations to improve even further. 
Um, and this is a webinar, but I like it to be a two uh, a two way seminar. Um, so I would kindly ask you to get out your secondary devices um, or use a second screen on your computer um, and go to menti.com and type in the code 53,696,493 or for the mathematically challenged 53696493 or scan the QR code. Uh, and actually also people who have a, an interesting uh, and very specific preference for 53, 69, 64, 93. It's like with uh, these navigation systems. People like some people like head up, some people like north up, and and the two um, will never be able uh, to bridge that gap. So try menti.com and use the code 53696493. And I've got a first question um, just to test whether the system works. Um, and it may sound like a very strange question. Um, yep, indeed. And, and it also shows you can directly um, uh, uh, produce information on the screen. But haha, there is a profanity filter installed. So if you think you're five minutes of fame, uh, 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 this is it, well, bad luck. So I have a question for you and, and, and the rest of the people, don't worry, please, please uh, uh, log in. Um, and, and I have a very simple and straightforward question for you. I wake you up at three o'clock at night. Um, and my first question to you is, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about safety? So let's see. So what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about safety? And by the way, I will share the, the, the sheets together with your results uh, with Stuart. So you, could, you can look back on what you answered. So we, it, we, we see an, an, a very interesting word cloud popping up here. And although it's only a test question, it's very interesting to see that when we talk about safety, um, we, we tend to assume that we all think about the same thing. But, but in fact, uh, there, there are very large cultural differences, but also the differences within the same culture um, even between organizations of what we, what we think about uh, when we think about safety. Uh, um, for instance, a lot of people, especially after the pandemic, now think about uh, health when they think about safety. Um, and, 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 and to some extent, that, that is the result of, of all kinds of uh, uh, actions by, by governmental agencies, uh, uh, for instance, to, to uh, keep, uh, keep, keep your distance for your own safety. Um, and uh, so we see, see a kind of blurring there, uh, but also family is very important, protection, home, helmet, um, acceptable risk, um, protection, as a, so, so many, many answers, colleagues are okay, how we do things, um, and we tend in, in general to define safety in terms of uh, what can we do about it or in terms of consequences. Uh, so in your next safety meeting, when you discuss uh, safety, uh, uh, take into account that not everybody may think about the same thing when they talk about safety. So I've now got a, a more serious question to you. Um, and it, that's in my organization, we learn from successes as much as from failures. I see a human error popping up there. Of course, it's a bit of a biased public because, I mean, if you all had scored yes completely, you probably wouldn't have shown up for the seminar. But just looking at the average, which is absolutely totally meaningless, but always a nice indication, um, look at the distribution. There are many uh, people out there that, uh, and I hope that that is, is what you take from my presentation uh, and from this webinar, is that, that there's a massive underutilization 
of information. And, and the question of course is what can we learn from successes um, and why is that essential? Um, and and um, my career in safety started uh, many decades ago, say about 40 years ago. Uh, and if I had given a presentation in those days, I would probably have started with the accident of the week, blowing up a platform or a nuclear reactor or sinking a vessel or something. Uh, safety was very much defined with the big disaster in, in those days. Um, and that was actually the way to go for it. Nobody would ever talk about a success story in those days. And, and, and rightly so, because there was really a lot going on uh, that didn't go down very well. I mean, many accidents. And if you would go back in time, you would be absolutely abhorred by, by what you uh, would see. Um, but, but we live in different times now. Um, as I see, you see the, 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 the progress in the International Oil and Gas Producing uh, Association members uh, and you see that the number of fatal accidents um, and, and you see the, the going down by about 96% per million man hours and the exposure uh, has increased massively. But you see that that we are now living in the last 4%. So I sometimes meet people and say, oh, you're, you're, we're doing very bad in safety. We've plateaued, human disaster. I say, well, you're either young or you have a very good, very bad memory because we we really become much safer. And the big challenge is now the last 4%, but as any statistical process controller can tell you, the last 4% in anything, improving anything, is always difficult. So why not look for a new source of information and try to utilize that? Um, and I would like to, to bring to you a case story that not everybody might like, um, but it's a nice illustration of what good looks like um, and, and a possible area for improvement. So it may be stuttering a bit, uh, but don't worry, it's only 8.2 seconds uh, long, and I repeat it four times in one in slow motion. Uh, and what you see here is the world record pit stop by Max Verstappen uh, at the 2019 Brazilian Grand Prix in Rio de Janeiro. So bear with me. Here he goes. Don't blink with your eyes because then you've missed it. 1.82 seconds. After he broke this world record, they actually changed the rules. Um, so it will never be broken. Uh, they outlawed fast pit stops like this because they thought it could not possibly be safe to go any faster. They wanted to avoid a race to the bottom. So here you see it in slow motion. This is an, an incredible achievement. So, so he, he's actually able um, to change the tires in, in what, what before was an, an almost impossible uh, fast time. So let's have a look at his performance. Uh, was this a, a one time only, or is there a more fundamental issue at stake that we could learn from? Well, here you see the statistics of the full 2019 Formula One season, all the pit stop times. And you see that the Red Bull team is about 0.4 seconds faster than any other team. Um, and you may not think that that's very much, but in, in the world of Formula One racing, that is a, a real leap. Actually, the data of about a decade ago was that six, six seconds was already fast, but the industry has progressed. Another thing that you can notice is that he's extremely consistent. Um, and and he, he never has a bad day and he's always very good. Um, but, but the interesting thing, of course, is that all these teams are good. They, I mean, there are no bad teams in Formula One racing. They're all very well motivated. They're all highly trained. Um, so how can it be that this Red Bull team is so much better? And what can we learn from it um, uh, uh, in, in the energy world? Well, of course, we could look at what we call incidents. So we could define as an organization that any pit stop longer than 15 seconds would be a cause of concern and we would look at it, uh, investigate it and, and, and find the underlying causes, remove them and that, that way we could improve. And there's definitely value in that. But you can also see that, that there's some companies, some, some racing teams that don't have uh, any incidents to investigate at all, but they still want to, to learn. So, so what to do, what to do. Haha, <laughs> good news. We also have something called a near miss. So we can define anything above 10 seconds as a near miss. But even then you see that the amount of learning opportunity is very limited. But, but I mean, of course we should keep on learning from these near, near misses and, and incidents because they give us valuable information about underlying factors that lead to these long pit stop times or, or incidents 
uh, in the energy world. But there's an untapped potential, and that is that we could ask ourselves is, okay, they're all great teams, but some teams are definitely better than others. And what is it that these teams do? So we do not learn from removing things at the right side, but we try to get information from the bottom to the top. So, so there, there's a whole untapped potential of good practices that are out there that make the difference between a great team and a super team. Um, and if we only look at incidents and never investigate on why are, what makes a team so great, uh, 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 we, 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 we underutilize uh, this untapped potential of information. And, and again, all these teams are great. They all uh, 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 adhere to the strictest standards, but some are greater than others. Uh, and, and we have consistently overlooked this factor in safety for, for the last decade. So he's always in the top 20, which is what you want in operations. Uh, and he's never in the bottom. So uh, he's always good, very consistently good, and never bad. And now you can argue, yeah, but you're, these are routine operations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but what happens if, if the team runs into something unexpected? Well, this happened in, in, in the Budapest uh, uh, Grand Prix. Um, Max ran his car at the side of the track. Um, the car was damaged, and they estimated that it took about six hours to repair. Um, so six hours, that, that, that's a lot, but it was, <laughs> the, the bad news is that they only had two hours before the race started. So we had a two hour deadline and a six hour problem. But the team came together and they're all experts and they decided to give it a go. Um, so they took the car off the track and here you can see Max, um, the back from Max and he's looking at his team um, and he puts the full responsibility of the team um, and, and, and they have to make sure that it's safe to drive, um, and if, if it's not safe, I mean, he might get killed, others might get killed, terrible news. So he put his full faith in, in the team. Uh, he trusts them completely. Uh, the team works and works and works and finds a solution by working together. Um, so, and, and they manage actually 20 seconds before the deadline uh, to finish a six hour job, which is in, even in the eyes of the competitors, an incredible, uh, uh, incredible performance and, 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 and really great. And Max eventually wins the race and he owes his results to the mechanics, um, which is fair to say. We tend to think about Max's performance as an individual performance, but in fact, it's team performance. And that's one of the first lessons we can learn from the Max Verstappen story. It's not about Max, it's about the team. Um, and what the team is very good is utilize the knowledge that is in the team. So he brings together people um, that, that, of course, they're all experts in the field, but one of the the, the, the bonus factors is that they work very efficient and effective together and they have a very open culture where they share information. Um, so they also come from a range of backgrounds uh, and they all bring in their expertise uh, and, and they all uh, add to the success of Max. So are they infallible? Of course, they're not infallible. Are they, uh, 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 but, but, but Max team has the, the ability to manage these deficiencies and turn them into opportunities. Um, and one of the, the, the key success factors in, in, in Max team is also that they look at each pit stop as an opportunity to learn from. So, so it's never a routine job for them. It's always something uh, they look at, evaluate. And even after the world record, they look very critical um, at what they've done. And they also learn very much from their competitor's pit stop and integrate that knowledge into becoming even better. So in his, in his team view, it's not only about avoiding incidents, long pit stop times, but it's becoming better every time uh, at what you're doing. So back to you. Um, Let's assume that in about five years, you've been extremely successful in reducing the number of incidents and that they decided that the safety department becomes obsolete because nothing has happened for the last four years. So yeah, why, why do we need a safety department? We, we're, we're at the top of performance. So, so you're all retired and, and you pursue a new career. I, I assume that, that, with, that, that many of you will be engineers. So, so you decide to, uh, or scientists in other areas, and, and you decide to apply your, your own knowledge on a new domain. Um, and, and you've all seen the great bake off and so on. So you decided to become the best baker in the country. Um, you sit together with, with a few experts and you decide that, that, that given certain kind of flour and, 
uh, for endless testing with, with kinds of ovens, um, you have found out that the ideal time to bake a consistent great bread is about 90 minutes. So, uh, so you took the Max Verstappen lesson and you say, I want to be the best baker in the world. I want to have the world record pit stop and I want it to be consistently the best. So uh, after this endless testing, you decided to start your own bakery chain and, and, and uh, you start with 80 bakers and you tell them all over the Europe, listen folks, 90 minutes is ideal baking time. But uh, you've been in the, in the energy world, so you also audit and you measure real performance. You find out that the baking time in the real world is actually this distribution. So you measure a few hundred uh, uh, times the bread was baked. Um, and you, this is the distribution. So, so, and so you're the, you're the head of the bakery. Um, you have instructed people to, uh, for, to bake the bread for 90 minutes. Uh, and this is what, what, you, what you get in the real world. So are you worried? Are you worried? Keep on answering and, 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 and you see about 27% is worried, 38% is not worried, 35% uh, doesn't know. Um, so that's, that's an interesting result. And um, you can keep on answering actually, but the, the question is why? Why are you concerned or not concerned? So, so Not enough information to understand the variation results, limited experience, due to this career, inconsistent performance, work is variable. It's not cooked properly and cooked for longer, potentially burned. Yes, you're worried about the, the end product. Uh, I don't know the impact on the product. Um, because I'm doing something wrong, consistent. Performance criteria, normal variability. Well, I wouldn't say this is normal variability. Um, outliers can damage reputation. So, so what is important that, that most of you, high energy cost could be reduced if you get the same results, um, unpredictability in operations. I don't know because an individual is in it. Um, but there's, there's a sense of curiosity in there. And that is actually the key to success in, in, um, in learning from what goes uh, right rather than learning from what goes wrong. Most organizations are only interested in learning when, when things go wrong. So they have basically this traditional model. They will only learn when things go into the red. So, so you can safely assure that anything cooked only 50 minutes is still too raw and that 150, it is definitely black. So it's inconsistent with the goal of, of consistently baking the best bread ever. But why wait for the incident? Why don't we just look at the distribution rather than only the, the end result? And, and you can spot variation in the baking times. And it is not necessarily bad. It's not necessarily good. It's, it's interesting because maybe they are, it's, they're, they're very good local bakers who adapt to the local situation. So maybe it's too humid, maybe it's too dry, maybe the flour is not consistent, maybe the quality of the oven is not okay, and they adapt to the local situation, um, and, and they actually uh, help you achieve your goal. Could also be is that someone found accidentally that 110 minutes actually produces even better bread, uh, so that, that we call that innovation. It could also be that someone is only baking it for 70 minutes because they, they, they think, well, I can bake twice as much for, or 30% or, or more, um, so, so why bother uh, about the quality? So you should have a serious conversation with this person. But the real trick is that, that the new way of learning doesn't limit itself only to the red zones. The, the new way of learning is look at the distribution and say, hmm, 
Interesting. What's behind it? Let's find out what goes on there. And as I said, it's not necessarily bad that you have variation. What is bad is when you have variation that you don't understand um, and that eventually leads to adverse consequences. But what's also bad is you, you, if you would miss on an opportunity to innovate because this variation also might imply that someone else did a better job and you should learn from that and, and become the next standard in baking bread. Uh, and and, and yeah, so so you improve. So uh, 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 some, uh, this is what we call an, an innovation. And 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 imagine that you want to that you that, that, that you now for plenty of time. So you start uh, uh, running half marathons or marathons, um, and you want to improve your performance. Uh, and the good news is uh, that you don't really have to train any much harder if you want to improve your performance by four to five or even seven, eight percent, just wear these shoes. Uh, it's the vapor flies and they improve the efficiency of your running uh, in such a way that without any extra training, haha, you can run much longer and much faster. Um, and, and how is this uh, 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 identified? Because it was, it was a, uh, it, it, there was variability in the running uh, of people and they found out that certain characteristics of the shoes would consistently lead to faster times and it was taken on board and used as an as an innovation so uh, some people think that variation is bad news by definition but it's actually a source of inspiration and that's exactly what happens in the first upper team they look upon variation as opportunities to learn from with the end goal of always want to perform at the highest standard so i conclude we have two approaches and they're complementary to each other. So please keep on thinking about causes of incidents. Um, and, and in many cases, they should be uh, eliminated bad news. Uh, but investigate variation. Um, and it means that you don't only look at incidents, but you look at a normal way of operating. Uh, and, and that ties in nicely with, with the next uh, speaker. Um, and eventually you, you will see that if you, if you look at the normal way of operating and you change the variance, um, it also leads to less extreme outcomes. So, so yes, sometimes consistency um, is important. And by looking at the sources of inconsistencies, you can find causes um, of improving even further. Um, and please embrace lessons learned if there's a positive outcome. Um, and, and one of the issues we find in organizations is that they don't really have an infrastructure um, for that. Uh, one warning, and, and be, is as inter be as interested in positive surprises as of negative ones. Uh, so if you have a shutdown that should last for five weeks uh, and, and the, the, the company uh, the, the com the, the comes to you and says, well, it's now two weeks uh, and we finished it, um, then you can think, well, that's great news. Uh, they finish three weeks early, but you you better ask. So how is it possible that you finish three weeks earlier? Um, because I want to know. I mean, this is a really substantial change, and and um, so I, it's not really directly a source of concern. Um, but we should also ask questions when things are go too good uh, to be true. Um, share the lessons learned. Um, and, and as I said, create an infrastructure within your organization to share those lessons. Um, and uh, one side effect that I find extremely important is that it also gives a positive ring to safety. It's not only a, avoiding disaster, it's about improving uh, uh, in every aspect of the work um, and utilizing all the information that is available um, in a more efficient and effective way. And well, ultimately, of course, Max became world champion, but that's beside the point. This was about pit stops, but he is really great at everything. So, so let's learn his lesson on how to improve even further. And with that, I give the floor back to Stuart. Well, thank thank you very much. So, um, so uh, please do put your questions into the Q and A uh, box. I'm sure we'll have, I'm sure you'll have many questions. I've got a few as well. Um, so I'd like to say, if you could stop sharing your screen, yep, and um, and we'll hand over to our second speakers, which uh, Martin. So, uh, Martin, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Just please confirm when you can see my screen. Yep. 
Fantastic. So welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, and um, good evening. Pleasure to be here. Um, and I'll start by asking you four questions. Would, would you like to be able to find out which activities are likely to result in an accident? Get your workers to tell you what is really going on. Find and address the causes of accidents before they happen and make proactive learning part of your culture. Sounds good to be true? I'll show you how we did it. And I'll show you the resources we created so you can do it too. Stay with me till the end to get the link to the um, resources that enable, uh, may enable your organization to embark on advance on this journey. But first, a short introduction. As an industry, we continually learn from incidents and over time we've become safer. The safer we are, the fewer incidents we have to learn from. But in reality, the lack of accidents is not a good indicator of how safe we actually are. For example, the largest industry disasters occurred with long time injury-free operations. Therefore, we need to find a way to learn and improve when unintended consequences are absent. Typically, we think that if a task is completed without an incident, it is a success. Only a very small percentage of all activities result in an undesired event, and the vast majority of them are completed without a problem. And as a result, it's easy to think that no additional work is needed in the shadow of success. Does it mean, however, that all those activities that didn't result in an event were executed flawlessly? Rarely is attention paid to how the activities were completed, what challenges were encountered, and where seeds of a future accidents evident. Learning from normal work, also known as pre-accident investigation, is about proactively looking into things that make the work difficult, increase the chances of error, and how dependencies between different groups may contribute to incidents in the future. When there is an incident, it's easy to think that it happened because something went wrong. For example, somebody didn't identify a hazard or didn't move away from the line of fire. Similarly, when the job is completed without an incident, it's easy to assume that all hazards were identified, all procedures were followed, and all controls were applied. When things go wrong in organizations, our assumption tends to be that something or someone malfunctioned or failed. When things go right, as they do most of the time, we assume everything worked as imagined. Success and failure, therefore, are thought to be fundamentally different. We think there is something special about unwanted occurrences. However, when wanted and unwanted events occur, people are often doing the same sorts of things that they usually do. They do normal work. They may miss the hazards, work in the line of fire, skip steps in the procedure. What differs is the set of circumstances, interactions, and patterns of variability in the surrounding conditions. So what is normal work? Normal work is about how people adapt to changing conditions and challenges they face as part of their job. For example, using a crane to lift a load. Every time an operator does it, there may be something different about the situation. For example, less time available than planned, additional people in the area, one person being off work and not available, or correct tools not available, such as lifting slings. Adapting to overcome the various challenges is part of what needs to be done. It's normal work. Learning from normal work is about proactively looking into things that make the work difficult and increase the chances of error or nonconformance. Okay, but what does it all mean in practice? It means that the conditions that will create your next accident exist today, and we can find and address them before they lead to an accident. Now, I'll show you four examples of such learnings achieved through different tools, and then I'll tell you about the industry resources that enable you to start learning from normal work in your organization. This is a real example of a simple walkthrough talk through for a preventative maintenance on a lathe machine. 
A walkthrough talk through is a simple technique focused on breaking the task into steps and discussing what may be the consequences if the step is misperformed and what makes the execution of each step difficult. This is based on the fact that different steps have different failure modes and are influenced by different constraints. So in this column are the steps copied verbatim from the maintenance procedure. In the second column, we see the potential consequences if a step is misperformed. On the third column, we see examples of constraints and varying conditions. So let's now focus on step three. This step is to check if the machine air pressure is 85 PSI, because the incorrect amount of pressure may damage the equipment. And so by talking to the operator, we realize that the gauge shows the pressure in megapascals. This means that the same pressure would be expressed with different numbers when using PSI and megapascal units. This could confuse the operator and lead to a mistake. Finally, we take the findings and discuss with the operator how to best address the challenges that we found. So an easy fix for step three is to update the procedure and change the units to megapascals to make it consistent with the pressure units used on the machine. This is another example. In, our, in one of our workshops, a team was working with these large spools. This is a seven ton spool being lifted with a standard 10 ton crane. You can see the size of the spool on the picture. The spool needed to be lifted about 15 centimeters and moved across the room. You would think, well, okay, that's not that difficult to do, but it is. One of the things that we picked up on was that the operator was too close to the spool. And the reason was that the crane control was a cable type system which was limiting where the operator could stand and what he could see, therefore requiring a spotter. Please note how the operator was forced by the work environment to be close to, be, to the line of fire. The spotter was on the other side of the spool and it was difficult to see each other. When we started looking at the crane controls, it had left, right, forward, and backwards type of buttons on that. So depending on the orientation of the spotter versus the crane operator and the limited visibility, you could easily make a mistake in the direction you wanted the crane to move. We decided that if they just used a remote control and then put some directional indicators using things like east and west, and then line up the equipment so that everything was moving in a particular direction. The crane operator could move around and he always knew what direction he was going. And by making this simple improvement, we eliminated the need for the spotter and therefore for using verbal communication. And if you think about moving large loads like this, it could result in a life-changing injury if someone was struck by it. The team was able to identify conditions that could result in the mistake and eliminated the potential for the injury. Now, please note two important points. If there was an accident while lifting this load, we would probably have found exactly the same things we found now. And secondly, the typical risk assessment would not capture the factors we found because the inconsistency in design of control is difficult to be categorized as a source of harm, in other words, a hazard. And therefore it would not feature in risk assessment and would not have controls. That's why we focus on things that make it difficult to uncover constraints um, on top of the hazards. Another example, we perform hundreds of lifts every day in our workshops, and we wanted to reduce the risk of an incident before it happened. Typically, the lifts are categorized as standard and complex lifts, and we use learning team approach to find potential precursors of an incident. We sat together with a broad group of people, including workshop operators, foremen and supervisors, safety professional, operations leader, and manufacturing engineering team, and asked them about what makes their work difficult and how the next incident could happen during this activity. We've identified over 30 improvement opportunities. For example, operators told us that the information that they needed for standard lifts, such as weight, the center of gravity, or type of slings, 
is not easy and convenient to access. There were just few laptops in the workshop. Uh, it took time to walk to them. There may be somebody using it, or if you rarely use the computers, you could forget your password. It's difficult to locate the information that you need in the database. All this make time, make more, uh, take more time than you may have available to prepare for the lift. And sometimes people were not using it, relying on their past experience. Then we've heard that for complex lifts, for example, sometimes important information was not available in the database or was incomplete. And some operators who may be involved in those lifts did not have sufficient skills and uh, didn't have the right type of uh, complex lift training. So to address these issues, we are now uh, introducing tablets and making improvements to the usability of the database to make the information easy and convenient to access. In other words, to make it easy to do the right thing. And again, none of those things I mentioned would feature in hazard identification, job safety analysis, or other forms of risk assessment focusing on hazard identification. We have changed how the information for the complex lifts, lifts is provided and added cross checks to ensure that the information is correct. We are also training all our operators on complex lifting techniques. These are some examples out of many other improvements uh, that we've introduced as a result of looking into what makes the work difficult. We can also apply the principles of learning from normal work to leadership safety conversations. It's common practice that managers visit their operations on a regular basis to interact with people doing the job. Often these discussions are focused on checking compliance or workers' understanding of risk. The questions that may be asked, um, for example, do you have a procedure? What's the worst thing that can happen to you? Show me your risk assessment. Although these questions may be helpful under some circumstances, they do not shed light on how people may be set up for failure. So in the IOGP guidance I'll mention in a moment, we propose to ask a different set of questions focused on what is getting in a way of completing this task safely and or efficiently? What makes this job difficult? What do you need to be set up for success? What do you need to complete the work safely and efficiently? Please note how those two questions prioritize the needs of the worker. Next one, what is the advantage of doing it this way? Imagine you've got uh, a worker puts, holds their fingers close to pinch points. It's easy to say you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it, do something different. But asking question, what's the advantage of holding your hands in that position may reveal a very important insights. Or tell me about situations when you need to deviate from procedures or processes to complete the job. Those questions can be asked informally as part of the conversation, and they tend to focus on the conditions and uh, that surround the work um, and tend to put people at ease because they do not feel threatened um, by the uh, tone or angle of the conversation. So to help organizations to transition to proactive learning, IOGP will publish a new guide on proactive learning later this year. I've had the privilege to lead the writing effort. Um, the document has been approved by over 40 senior and executive leaders across the upstream segments, um, published later this year, and it was called um, The Game Changer in Accident Prevention. So this all is Great, but a reference document on its own is not sufficient to create the change in organizations that we may need. We need an implementation system to make it happen in practice. So as part of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, human factors technical sections that I lead, building on years of hands-on experience in implementing proactive learning in practice, we've developed the implementation system. So what do organizations need to make learning from normal work part of their safety management? Our experience shows that in order to benefit from proactive learning, three elements need to be in place. Number one, a new mindset. That includes understanding error traps, understanding constraints, what's behind procedural non-compliance, dependencies between teams, and more. A new skill set of skills focused on how to ask questions that open people up, 
and find local constraints, dilemmas, and trade-offs. And a new set of tools, such as enhanced leadership visits, walkthrough, talkthrough, learning teams I showed you earlier. The SPE implementation system addresses all three of these essentials in a way that is scalable and can be deployed to a large group of um, workers. The, it provides the new perspectives on and language for leaders so that they can create pool for integrating this approach into their ways of working. It builds a range of hands-on skills in practitioners to apply learning from normal work. And it contains step-by-step -step guidance on how to use these tools. All this through a rapid culture transformation system that combines the best aspects of digital and face-to-face -face learnings. So if you'd like to learn more and explore how um, this may benefit your organization, um, go to this link and I will also paste now the, um, the link in the chat box. This is SPHFTS as in human factors technical section dot org slash learning from normal work with hyphens. Um, and so if that sounds interesting, um, please express your interest uh, on the website. So with this said, thank you very much for your time and I'll hand over to Stuart. Excellent. Thank you very much, Martin. So fantastic presentation, two fantastic presentations, in fact. Um, and I see we have a few questions coming in. So just a reminder, really, if you've got questions for uh, either Yop or Martin, uh, please do type away in the Q&A um, box. And um, Yop, if you can, oh, you, you've turned your camera on. Excellent. So um, <clears throat> where to begin? Where to begin? So let me have a look at the questions we've got. We've got a few questions now. Um, I'd like to start with a question um, of my own, actually, for, for, for both of you before we get to the, uh, uh, the questions from the audience, just give people a bit of time to continue. Um, adding questions. So a question for you, for you Yop. So you, you talked obviously a lot about Formula One and uh, and uh, I guess a hypothetical baking example. Um, uh, what other industries or what, what other than say Formula One are sort of taking this approach, measuring variability and performance? Is there anything else you can uh, tell us about um, how other industries are using this approach? Yes, to give you, uh, thank you, Stuart, uh, to give you two, uh, two examples. One is the, the railway example where uh, the Dutch railways uh, were really, uh, they ran out of, of, of information to help them reduce the number of trains passing red signals at dangerous paths. Um, and and um, eh, they, they didn't have any internet anymore and the investigations of the dispatch itself didn't reveal much more information that they could use. So what we did is, is we looked at the train driver behavior and looked at the variance in their behavior. Uh, and, and we used the, the, the work of Walter A. Schuhart from 1932. Uh, and, and, and he actually postulated that sources of variation should be uh, uh, investigated. Um, and, and this is what he applied, so very old technology. Um, and we found that um, doubling the feedback in terms of signals to the train drivers um, reassured the train drivers that they could more or less uh, anticipate on the next signal and it made their uh, driving behavior far more consistent, eventually leading to far more trains passing red signals. So rather than focusing on what was seen as the bad apple dispatch, we focused on the normal driving behavior, changed the normal behavior, driving behavior and the end result was less bad. The second example is from the medical uh, domain um, you have something called the door to needle time, which is the time necessary if you have a certain brain hemorrhage that, to, that you really need to be within one hour uh, uh, to get a needle with the, the, the medication. And um, in the Netherlands, this was, was measured uh, in the whole country, and it turns out there was a huge variation in performance. Um, all those hospitals, of course, thought they were doing a great job, but some did definitely better jobs than others. So they sat together. And they decided to look at what makes one team even better than the others. Um, and that led to an enormous reduction of variation in the door to needle time. Um, and, and for instance, things like planning, preparation, the quality of the team, but predominantly also the number of times this happened turned to be a very important factor. Uh, and the end result is that the worst now is better than the best before. 
um, not because they focused on the really bad and long times, but they focused on how to improve the way of work. So it, uh, there's so much untapped information that you can learn to improve even further um, if, if, if you're somehow lost in terms of information. So, so two examples from two domains, but I, I only yes. have, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, hopefully it helps you. Yeah. Excellent. No, thank you very much. Uh, Martin, a question for you then um, that, that I, I was thinking uh, as you were showing your four examples of the um, uh, the tasks that uh, you looked at in Baker Hughes, uh, how did you identify those tasks? W were those tasks identified through the normal, you know, safety critical task analysis and other means or were they identified uh, in, in some other way? Yeah, so there are a couple of different ways that we actually approach that. Um, number one is we look for trends. So we look um, the incidents in the past, um, but then from there we extract what the activity was um, that is associated with the incident. And so if there is a pattern, um, we would look into that. The second uh, way is to look into our uh, risk profile of activities. So for example, we know that complex lifts uh, that occur more often with multiple people in the area will have higher potential severity than uh, some, some other activities. Um, and so here, again, you can look into try to quantify that. Um, but what we often do is we get together with a group of experts and, um, and have a discussion and take a judgment based on people's experience. Um, then another uh, way is to um, look into what leaders and workers are concerned about. So if I ask a question, okay, in your division, what is, uh, what are you most concerned about? Um, the leader would tell me something based on their experience and history of interactions with others uh, and other uh, more or less subtle cues uh, that are available in his environment. Um, and the same if I ask the worker, uh, what, you know, what, um, what are you worried the most about in your uh, area, for example, they would point me to some things because they would have the um, contextual understanding of how things uh, almost went wrong or what, uh, what is particularly problematic um, in, that, uh, in that area. So we use a combination of, of things to identify where to focus on. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so question, first question from the audience here then. So how, how does the idea of accepting variable uh, performance sit with the legal requirement to have safety rules that set minimum standards, such as speed limits in residential areas designed to minimize severity of injury if hit by a car. So how does this will sit with the, you know, the, the minimum requirements, I suppose, that we have to have in place? Yeah, and I'll be happy to, to, to start. Um, Professor Holnagel uh, offers a great example um, in his writing and um, he says, that yeah, so you've got the uh, boundary conditions, right? So you shouldn't drive more than, for example, 70 or 100, depending on where you are. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that as you're driving, you are continually adapting to the um, changing conditions. So cars in front of you just slow down. So you have to slow down. There is um, a pedestrian running towards the road. So you take a precautionary maneuver and enter the other line. Um, you've got an incident, so now you have to take a detour. So you see that even though the boundary condition uh, exists uh, all the time, um, you your performance vary on an ongoing basis. And there may be occasions where you actually need to consciously break the, um, the, the boundary condition. Um, when, for example, uh, under unique, some unique situations, you, you need to speed up, for example, to avoid danger if, if, if that's something that happens on, uh, on the road. So here they are not necessarily contradictory um, as people will continue to adapt within the boundary conditions. Thank you. Uh, and Rob, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, yes, I, I fully agree. And I would like to add that, that the trick of this new approach or actually very old approach, but it's now reinvigorated um, is that you would you would look at the. You wouldn't wait for children to be killed. You would look at the at the at the, at the variation in in driving behavior, uh, and ask yourself if there is some kind of a boundary between thirty and fifty kilometers. Why are why is there so much variation? 
Um, and and, and, and as, as you explained, it, uh, as Martin said, there, there could be good reasons, but it could also be is that, for instance, the environment invites you to drive faster or they're confusing signals. And so, so uh, rather than wait for something terrible to happen, uh, you can keep a, a small problem small by looking at initial signals that derive from variation that you do not understand. Um, so so I, I would put a speedometer there uh, and, and, and interview people uh, uh, and, and ask them what actually determines um, the way they drive and not wait for incidents to happen, but try to influence their normal way of driving. Excellent. Okay. So next question here is, uh, it says it's directed at, at YOP. Um, so what would you consider to be the most important variations to address when considering process and people safety? Um, well, the, the more abstract answer would be is the variation that I cannot understand. Um, so if I find a, a variation that I do not understand, but if you look at this from a human factors perspective, um, the, the, for instance, fatigue is a, is a real cause of variation um, and, and also time of the day in terms of uh, performance variability. If you, if, being, if, if you have to do a job at three o'clock at night, um, after two hours of work, and this is the 11th hour in your shift, the probability of failure is much higher. So you would see in, in the performance curve a huge variability of people working uh, under those conditions. Um, I know the industry is, is very much concerned about things like alcohol abuse, and, and, and rightly so. Um, but most of that problem has been eliminated over the years. And I would say that on, on, the, on my top spot, um, uh, it would probably uh, be fatigue and working hours. Um, and if I look at it from a more organizational perspective, I, I think it is a poor teamwork. So lack of information within the team, lack of exchange of information, people do not take care of each other. And that's also why, why most of my work now focuses on optimizing teamwork, hoping to reduce variation uh, in, in the outcome of processes, ultimately leading to better performance. Excellent. And uh, Marcin, anything you'd like to add to that? I think that was excellent answer. <laughs> okay, excellent. Right, uh, so the next question then. So, uh, so how can you determine when an organization is ready to take this approach, i.e. when having a high number of adverse incidents, there are plenty of learning opportunities. Um, so yeah, at what point is an organization ready to, to adopt this approach? So in my experience, there are a couple um, factors that um, that help. One is incidents. So typically, if you've got a large number of incidents, the resources tends to be tied with, with that. Um, and so uh, in order to you know, analyze variability and, and that, you may need uh, more resources. So, so I understand that. that. That's sugar, although that's not necessarily a, uh, something that cannot be resolved. The second very important factor is the leadership uh, understanding of um, the modern view of safety and incident causation. If leaders tend to strongly believe that um, accidents happen because of um, mistakes and um, people and therefore blame and punitive actions is the best way to deal with that, uh, it will be difficult to learn uh, proactively because that requires trust uh, and talking about delicate matters, for example, non-compliances, uh, how situations may you know, influence you and that which is very difficult um, if there is uh, blame. So that uh, organizational mindset uh, is an important um, uh, factor, which by the way, I hope that the SPE toolkit um, uh, would help to, um, to, to address. Um, and then I think those two approaches can be run in parallel. Of course, if you start learning from normal work, no one says that you should stop learning from, uh, from incidents. Um, and actually you can uh, reduce the cost because investigations are very costly from the financial point of view, not only in terms of lost potential equipment, uh, types of harm and uh, delays, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the learning proactively is a fraction of this cost. So um, you could um, compare them financially and say that there is a business, a business case for proactive uh, learning. Um, and I've created a infographic comparing the costs of reactive and proactive uh, learning that we'll be publishing uh, later today. So that would be my take on that. 
Okay, excellent. And Jop, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I would say that that blame is wrong also in 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 trying to find out sources of variation. Um, so in in all approaches, actually, if you have a, a leader that that looks uh, for for blame. Uh, and uh, uh, the, if you have a, a not so very mature uh, uh, um, management in, in, in both approaches, you could actually run into problems. Um, my main worry in hospitals um, is that, they, uh, that they, they are more or less jumping on a bandwagon of what they consider to be the new way of thinking uh, without realizing that they still have a massive amount of incidents where they could get information from. So, so uh, there are actually hospitals who said, I completely stop investing in incidents because Holnagel told us that uh, they are whatever. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. And, and that is, I find, a, a dangerous approach. So I, I fully agree we should have a, 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 a dual approach um, and rather than abandon um, one of the other. Um, so, so that's what I would like to add, but that's it. Yeah. Okay, so, so how, how, how do you respond to people who say they think they're already doing this? Uh, that's an excellent question, yeah. and I've heard uh, this question many times um, when talking about normal work. And what I found is, uh, of course, people mean something different uh, when they talk about. So, for example, they may say, but we're doing risk assessment, therefore we are finding you know, hazards. And so we are learning and trying to control those hazards. So that's in a way proactive learning, and in a way it is. Um, or others said, but we are investigating hypos and near misses, right? So you didn't have an incident and we are investigating those. And in a way it is. And I think a part of it is the um, understanding what they mean. And then to help with that, I've created a number of resources. So if you go to that page, I pasted to, at the very bottom, there is a few links that compare proactive or this learning from normal work with incident investigations, uh, investigating near misses, uh, risk assessments, uh, or behavioral safety observations. That's also one I said, you know, I, I have an observation with the worker and therefore I learn. Th that's fine, but there will be um, differences. And the differences is what actually you're looking for and how you're looking for it. So we are going beyond hazards and looking into psychological or organizational influences, trade-offs, dilemmas, um, and other forms of constraints that uh, other methods um, tend to not to focus on. Um, and to, to sum up, it just requires a conversation to better understand what they mean. Okay. Yeah, and, and Job, uh, you may have been coming in at the beginning. I don't know if you had a, a, you, some, uh, anything to add? Uh, no, not really. It's a great answer. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Next question. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, right. Uh, oh. Sorry, just my mouse cursor is getting away from me. Uh, so should practice be communicated in the same way as lessons learned from incidents? How can employees be encouraged to share things that have gone well uh, if it's not mandatory? Uh, if, it, if you only manage these kind of things because it's mandatory, you're probably not fit for this approach anyway. This is for the for the for the group of organizations that moves beyond mandatory. There's no law that says you should excel rather than just be great. Um, but but that's the easy the easy answer. And and one of my one of my issues and this very serious issue is is, is the, the lack of infrastructure in organizations to deal with this kind of information. I know of one organization where they decided to put all the great ideas. Uh, about to improve normal work in their incident reporting system. And it, <laughs> the system accordingly exploded. Managers were extremely confused uh, and they just couldn't cope with it. Um, so, so if you look at it from a worker's perspective, we know that ultimately it is visible change and recognition that does the trick. So if you have great ideas to improve the normal way of working, um, uh, make sure that, the, 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 that you make it visible that you have changed something and, and give recognition for that. Uh, and traditionally, engineers are not very good at that. They just think, well, we've changed it. They, they can see it has been changed so that now they must immediately appreciate that this change is a result of their action. Um, and, and most people actually don't. So you have to create an infrastructure in which you give feedback to people and recognize their input in a positive manner. Mm -hmm. And Marcin, I mean, you obviously talked a lot about how you've done it in Baker Hughes. I mean, how did you 
enact the changes or did you, did you communicate the changes that you'd made you know more widely in the in baker hughes or with other organizations how, how did you do that sure so a few thoughts um i'm not convinced that communication on its own is sufficient right um if i think about the assumptions behind how we tend to learn i often see the assumption that if we share an example then that will change someone's awareness the the awareness will change their behavior and the new behavior will uh, prevent harm for example prevent accidents and, and, and this this assumption the, this chain of assumptions is based on the uh, still popular view that it's the individual behavior that makes work safe or unsafe which we know from last two decades or three decades of science or more that it's not the case so therefore for me if you look about some of those examples i i, I showed you right so we take those learnings and then I gave it to a different team, a different uh, site, different location. Say, okay, address this. this. This is what happened. It would not be automatic that they would say, okay, we applied it. Their situation may be different. Their context may vary. Their crane may be a different arrangement. The resources may be different. So there is a process needed for, of sense-making. Okay, we've learned that this site did that. What does it mean to us in our context, our situation, our resources, our... Um, uh, 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 people that, that we have doing, the customers, etc. And so I, for, for me, it's more effective to have a discussion focusing on translating, okay, this applies, this doesn't apply, this we cannot do like that, we need to tweak that. Um, and so that part of conversation translation uh, would be key. And then we are working on introducing a structure to uh, learn from each other. So to validate, have anyone else, you know, implemented those actions? Is there something even better out there applied? So, um, so, so we've, we, we're developing a process um, behind it, but uh, communication with sense-making or the trans trans discussion focus on translation, what it means to us for me would be key. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Well, thank you very much. So, just looking at the, uh, I don't think we've got any other questions, there's a few comments here. Um, learning from excellence community in healthcare is an inspirational movement that has been doing this for about six years. I don't know, Yop, if you've heard of the Learning from Excellence communique, uh, community yep. in healthcare. Um, excellent. Uh, you know, thanks for your thoughts, Yop, and uh, uh, the presenters have done a good job offering, offering a more mature and balanced presentation of how learning from novel work adds to rather than replaces learning from events. So as those aren't questions, I will... Um, uh, close the session there and th thank you Yop and thank you Martin for the very interesting presentations thank you to everyone who uh, who asked questions and just a reminder that our next uh, webinar is uh, coming up in in July um, the, uh, the recording from this webinar will be sent around in a few days as well as a link to the next webinar um, and the links that Martin has uh, included will be included in that web, uh, that email as well and um, presentations. One of the questions there was around the questions that you put in your presentation, Marcin. Uh, and are you happy to share that presentation or those yeah, questions? Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. So we, we yeah. can do that. And I also pasted that in the answer. Excellent, no problem. So, so, so thanks very much again to our two speakers and thanks to our audience. And uh, um, uh, have a good rest of the day and might see some of you on our next webinar. Thank you for, the, for having us. Thank you.